Okay, so I'm, I'm going to do a lot of reading just because uh, I want to make sure what I've planned to say is what I actually say and that I actually finish on time and it, it might not be quite as dynamic anyway. All right, so crucifixion, it's a made-up word that I made up and uh, we will explore what this means of God works on us in sanctification the same way he worked on Jesus uh, by crucifying us, which is a metaphor. So in February of 2017, 2017, I became ill with the flu. For two weeks, I was sicker than I have ever been, completely unable to do anything. The lowest point came when my eardrum burst from the buildup of congestion in my head. The pain inside my skull was torture, and it continued for hours after the rupture as fluid continued to press on the raw nerves of the wound. I lost my hearing completely in that ear for several weeks afterward and my balance was disrupted with vertigo for the next half year. This was an occasion of brief and severe suffering. My cries to God seemed to evaporate. He seemed to be absent from me in my distress. I felt close to Job, but not close to God, but God was close to me. I experienced that he has important things to do to, with us when we suffer afflictions of many kinds. The Gospels tell a startling statement of Jesus that anyone who would follow him must do so by carrying one's own cross daily, just as Jesus bore his own cross. So in Luke 9, 23, he was saying to them all, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. This warning is repeated five times. The Apostle Paul adds that just as the cross was God's plan for Jesus, God also crucifies Christians. Yay. <laughs> Sanctification is the work of God to make an ordinary Christian like Jesus by doing to the Christian what was done to Jesus. Sanctification by making Christians to bear a cross in daily life is crucifixion. The Christian account of reality is very strange to our years, or at least it should be. The story as we believe it and tell it to each other is familiar for us, but it seems closer to mythology and films produced by Marvel Studios. Our society trusts in the scientifically framed account of reality. All else is suspicious as if it were propaganda or fantasy. We trust the Bible as God's word to frame our understanding of reality, but we must recognize that it is a truth that sounds very strange to our ears. Our Father in heaven created us with bodies. The body is a good gift. The body also makes us vulnerable to pain and suffering that compounds the internal and psychological distress of our ignorance, our misunderstanding, our compulsions, our fears. The whole creation groans with many pains, but we suffer individually a multitude of afflictions that come to us through our bodies and cause us great existential crisis and pain. All people suffer, but pain for the Christian makes us ask questions that other people don't. Where is God? Since my Heavenly Father can prevent or deliver me from pain, why do I have to suffer? Since some suffering is the consequence of personal sin, such as what we read about Israel's afflictions, they had famine and enemy attacks, how do we know that our suffering is something more than just simply God's punishment for our sins? What more could suffering be if pain is not the punishment for our sins? We do not like what we read in the Bible. We see people suffering and they belong to God. The people who are most faithful seem to suffer the most, starting with Jesus. I cringe when I see the repeated promises that Christians will suffer through some sort of individual share in bearing the cross. We see that Jesus suffered many afflictions bodily, and these culminated in the cross. So what does this mean that the Christian life means being afflicted in the ways that Jesus was afflicted? Was not the point of the cross that he suffered so that we will not have to suffer? He died in our place, right? So to restate some of these questions that uh, I hope to answer, where is our Heavenly Father when we suffer? What is he doing in our pain? Why do Christians suffer pains and troubles that seem to have no evangelistic purpose? Why does the Bible promise that suffering is the common experience of people who belong to God? Why is suffering effective? Why is it valuable for our Father's work in our lives? And why did even the Son of God have to suffer throughout his human life in the decades before the cross? The strange account in the Bible answers these many questions about suffering in a surprising way. God's curriculum for producing the Messiah as a suffering servant required many afflictions, 
And that same curriculum is repeated for us by our Father in heaven. And this is his loving care for us. Our prayer is that we would be transformed and able to live close with God. His answer to our prayer is that he makes us follow in Jesus' steps by bearing the cross for ourselves. Jesus is the model of the Father's work in all our lives. And that model is a suffering servant. He was beaten and crucified to death before being raised to his glory. The repeated metaphor of the Christian life is a long process of crucifixion. Christians are executed throughout their lives with Jesus. He hung on the cross for six hours. Our cross-bearing is a daily experience as long as we are alive here. How does this make any sense? The Christian must die with Jesus to be raised to life with Jesus. Sanctification is applied to the Christian as a lifelong crucifixion to attack the things that obstruct God's life for us. I'll present two claims bearing out this strange account of sanctification by crucifixion, God's work of crucifixion. We'll consider Jesus' suffering as the way to understand our distresses that are great and small in daily life. So, thesis one, whatever a claim, Jesus suffered in many ways to become the suffering servant and high priest for us. While it is true and essential that Jesus suffered for others at the cross to deliver them from everlasting suffering in hell, he also suffered in many ways that are not tied to paying for sins at the cross. Why? He suffered to be in solidarity with us in our pain from sin. He took our afflictions upon himself for at least five important purposes as part of becoming perfected as our high priest. So this means that if he had just come and gone to the cross, that would not have fulfilled salvation for us. So five purposes or so. The first purpose of Jesus' suffering was that through afflictions, his father formed him with empathy and sympathy from his firsthand experience as a man. His role as high priest required that he had to be made perfect as a high priest, which means he gained personal experience of pain as a creature so that he could engage with his suffering creatures. Three biblical passages tell uh, these ideas of Jesus' development through pain. So first, Hebrews 2.10, it was fitting for God in bringing many sons, that's inclusive of women, uh, to glory, to perfect the author, author of their salvation through sufferings. Hebrews 2.17-18, he had to be made like his brethren, inclusive of women, in all things, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. For since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. Uh, Hebrews 4, 15, 16. We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. Weaknesses is vulnerability to pain and temptation. But one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So because of his suffering, we know that God understands from the inside the physical, psychological, and social afflictions that cause us pain. God calls us to nothing that he has not suffered himself. He is no wimp or one who avoids valuable pain, but he voluntarily embraced afflictions so that he could be nearest to us in our suffering. He experienced it so he can meet with us in our distresses. Uh, the second purpose of Jesus' many afflictions is that being a true creature, he was truly subjected to the connection between suffering and learning. Some learning is through experiencing pain that results from stupidity or pride or some other wayward path. So we learn not to play with fire by experiencing the burning pain of a scorched hand. The learning of obedience to God has suffering as a price of the lesson. Trusting God's word and relying on him instead of ourselves is difficult because we suffer the delay or disruption to our plans or the loss of some goods we desired. For example, someone has a chance to get some money by working a side job, and then God warned him not to. So trusting God means not getting that money. Or a woman has a chance of keeping the boyfriend she wants to uh, of keeping the boyfriend who wants to have sex, so trusting God means being alone again. Or a student has a chance of getting a high grade in the class through lying about completing assigned reading. This could be valuable to retain a scholarship and be able to continue in college. So trusting God, being honest, means risking a break to college or an end to college. There is a cost. 
Despite the suffering that may come with holding to God, when we have endured, we learn that the price of suffering was worth the result of God's continued involvement with us. Instead of fearing the loss or pain that would tempt us to rely on ourselves or other people or money instead of God, when we have held to God and come through the trial to experience his nearness at the other end, we have learned that God is more valuable than suffering. The prospect of afflictions eventually diminishes as distractions from responding to God. Apparently, this was the case for Jesus also. Hebrews 5, 8, and 9. Although he was the son, or a son, uh, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation. Jesus had to experience many afflictions through which he learned, as we do, that the price of obedience to God is suffering. And the price we pay is worth the compensation we get from God. When God calls us to cling to him and trust his word, even when we suffer losses, rejection, slander, temptation to despair, or worse, as a result of our trust, we can be assured that Jesus has gone before us in this terrifying experience of suffering that comes with holding to God. Jesus did not need to be transformed in sanctification as we do, but he was subjected to a similar development process of learning obedience through suffering just as we do. We all desire to avoid suffering. Even Jesus did. But for Jesus and us, we can be reassured that our Heavenly Father has positive purposes in our afflictions, even as we see that accomplished in Jesus to perfect him as our priest. A third purpose of Jesus' pain is the aspect of unjust suffering. He shows how we are to respond to God and others despite unjust troubles that will happen to everyone in one way or another. Jesus looked at the pain that threatened him on multiple occasions, and he also looked at it according to the work of his father, what his father would accomplish by means of the pain. Like Jesus, we are called to look at the pain according to God's purposes, and so we may hold hopefully to God's providence even in our severe afflictions. The course of life that God has set out for us is like a race with many trials and difficulties that are very distressing. Our assurance is that Jesus has gone ahead of us in this. So still in Hebrews, Hebrews 12, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. On a similar note, uh, 1 Peter 2, 21 and 23, for you have been called for this purpose. In context, he's just been telling uh, slaves who are believers that they need to bear up under suffering they didn't deserve. This purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. And then highlighting his innocence, while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. Jesus had to suffer in many ways, culminating in the extreme affliction of the cross to show us how to do it. One aspect of suffering that can be especially hard to bear is the severe mistreatment by others when we have done nothing to deserve the onslaught. In our terms, racism, sexism, unfairness, injustice, being cheated or used, being discriminated against, and being punished by employers or other people are sharp pains because we did nothing to deserve what was done to us. Suffering that we did nothing to deserve is unavoidable for the Christian because this was, an, this was a central aspect of Jesus' suffering. And if we're only around other Christians, then this kind of stuff has to come to us from fellow Christians, which is very hard to be stabbed in the back by our brothers and sisters. Jesus suffered, nope, okay. Somehow his suffering in many ways that he did not deserve because he never sinned and had no part in the rebellious human race, his suffering is the most unjust affliction of any suffering for anyone. Jesus suffered simply because he chose to enter into our suffering as ordered by his heavenly father. Our solidarity with him increases when we suffer the way he did, being assaulted by pains we do not deserve. Our assurance is that he both understands this particular pain and he intends a good purpose for us when we endure it. The method of Jesus was to embrace the pain that had been ordered for him because everything that happened to him was purposed by his father. He obeyed his father and that obedience required the price of immense and varied aspects of affliction for him. 
The fourth purpose of Jesus' suffering is to show that afflictions of God's people are not punishments by God for personal sins. All of our sins were paid for at the cross. God is not punishing us, ever. That doesn't mean there aren't consequences, but that's not punishment. Since Jesus was sinless, then his afflictions were ordered for other purposes than punishment. Christians sim suffer simply because they are united to Jesus for several purposes of God's work in and through them for a limited time until we die. We suffer because our Father in heaven loves us, and he is answering our prayers to sanctify us and deliver us from sin. Fifth purpose, Jesus' experience is to show that affliction is often exerted by people committing evil, and paradoxically, these troubles are also ordered by God for good purposes. The cross is example of this simultaneous paradox of an evil act, no, an act of evil that God supervened for a good purpose. Similarly, Joseph was able to look back on the evil of his brothers who enslaved him in Egypt, and he could see God's intention for good along with his brother's intention for evil. These are hard things. Genesis 50, verse 20. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. Many events are told in the Bible so that we may see this dual intention of events that cause pain and suffering. One intention is of evil people or demons. Another intention is God's purpose to bring about great goods for salvation in the midst of a wrecked world. Jesus' suffering demonstrates this dual intention behind our afflictions. Sixth. Sixth purpose, sixth purpose is that Jesus suffered in many ways throughout his life so he could be a suffering servant for our salvation, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. We could sort this identification as the suffering servant with his function as our sympathetic high priest. The characterization is so sharp and strange that we need to focus on it for itself. So in Isaiah 53, it really should back up all the way to chapter 52, but We'll just pick this part up. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look on him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried that we esteemed him as stricken and smitten of God and afflicted. And skipping to verse 10, but Yahweh was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. Jesus suffered in many ways to become a man of sorrows acquainted with grief, the suffering servant of Yahweh through whom the many could be saved. Obviously, the cross is the lowest point of his pain and sorrow, but we can trace several other points of grief throughout Jesus' life. Now, for most of these, I have some biblical reference backing it up, but anyway, aspects of grief throughout his life. Uh, the social shame of his mysterious origin with Joseph not being his real father. In a small town, the strange story seems to have been known and shared with Jesus' enemies later on. He's accused of being a Samaritan, which was a racist term saying you're a half-breed. Uh, we know Joseph isn't your father. He endured immigrant life in Egypt when hunted by Herod in Judea. He was in condition of economic poverty and political oppression, uh, living under Roman occupation in Galilee. Uh, possibly, he experienced the loss of his adoptive father, Joseph, to death while Jesus was a young man. If true, then this loss meant that Jesus had to shoulder responsibility for his mother and six younger siblings which perhaps was part of the reason why he couldn't begin his public ministry until his 30s. We know he was still responsible for his mother's welfare when he died. That's a guess. Joseph doesn't show up anywhere in the time when Jesus is an adult, so that's what people guess. Whatever. Jesus was not exempt from pimples, bruises, headaches, insomnia, or sickness, or other injuries. Part of his mission was to suffer these things because we do, so that he could empathize with us in our afflictions, and lead us through them to the abundant life that God provides through Jesus. He endured starvation for over a month as the context for being tempted by the devil in the wilderness. 
His townspeople at Nazareth tried to kill him. He endured the frequent ridicule by the crowds and his enemies who accused him of demon possession and insanity. His natural brothers who did not believe in him before the resurrection also mocked him about going to Jerusalem to become more well known. Like the people of Nazareth who knew him from childhood, the crowds repeatedly sought to kill him when they were offended at his statements. And overall, Jesus was an adult who lived single and celibate into his later 30s. We should not imagine that he was exempt from desires for affection and solace and marriage and family. Yes, he knew the desire to want to have sex and not get to. He endured, he entered the physical distress of anticipating the wrath of God coming for him in the cross, whether it was blood coming out or sweat that was profuse like blood, it was bad. He was beaten with whips and fists by the Roman soldiers. He was crucified naked. His suffering on the cross was so extreme through enduring the wrath of God that he died after just six hours by comparison to the others who had to have their legs broken to end their lives. Crucifixion could last for two or three days. So just don't get the idea or don't hold on to the idea that it was a painful, horrible physical death that paid for our sin. He suffered hell at the cross, and that's why he died so quickly. Jesus suffered in many ways throughout his life to become the suffering servant and high priest for us. The many divine purposes for his various troubles show two important revelations. The first revelation is that Jesus' troubles were ordered by his heavenly Father. We see this most clearly in the cross, but this is not the exception among Jesus' life of many troubles including having to go down to Egypt and all that. So several passages point to this, focused on the cross. Luke 22, 22, the Son of Man is going as it has been determined. Who could it be determined by if it wasn't by God? Uh, Acts 2, 23, this man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men. Acts 3, 18, the things which God announced beforehand by the mouth of all the prophets that his Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. And then Acts 4, 27, 28, speaking of Herod and Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, they did whatever your hand and your purpose had predestined to occur. That's one of the six times predestined is used in the New Testament. So prepared for the Son, for Jesus, was a full mission of distress that culminated in his function as the high priest and source of salvation for others. The pain that Jesus suffered throughout his life has purpose as intended by God for good results. His suffering was the way he entered into our experience of trials in various kinds. Jesus is God's answer to our pain, that God the Son himself has faced and suffered what we endure. And out of that experience, he meets and gives us hope in the midst of our deepest distresses, the assurance that God is at work for our good. Our troubles are ordered by God also. The second revelation is that suffering is ordered by God for good purposes for the people that he loves most. His ordination of the cross is, shows that suffering is not merely the chaos of evil afflicting creation, although it is that. Suffering is ordered by God for good purposes for the people he loves most. Just as a loving parent cares most for her own children among all other children, and sees to their training that includes pressures and privations that are difficult to bear, so also God is a father to us, laying upon us the training and formation through troubles that Jesus also bore. So uh, we're going to return to Hebrews 12, but keep in mind what's translated as discipline all the way through here should not be understood as punitive or even corrective. It's the, the Greek word for education, which also means formation and training. So we've got a bad meaning for discipline, but maybe connect it to disciple. Uh, I would translate it differently, but they didn't ask me. So, <laughs> For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. So quoting from Proverbs, it is for discipline, or think formation, that you endure, that you're still here. God deals with you as with sons, inclusive of men and women. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, 
We had earthly fathers to discipline us, or train, form, disciple, and we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. So it's a way of talking about sanctification. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness, which again is sanctification. So Jesus suffered in many ways to become the suffering servant and high priest for us. Through afflictions of everyday experience, he is connected to us, and we to him in the common project of our Father in heaven to train us as his children. His goal is to make us alike with Jesus, suffering servants, emptied as vessels, emptied of our ambitions and illusions that we can do it. Why? So that he may fill our experience with the abundant life that is his own and that he can work through us for the good of others, not just for ourselves. So that's the first thesis. What happened to Jesus? Now, Thesis 2, Jesus' suffering for us does not exempt us from suffering with him in daily life as his disciples, brothers and sisters, and members of his virtual body on earth. We have listened to the notice of Hebrews 12 that the heavenly father of Jesus trained him by a painful curriculum of his lifelong mission to become the suffering servant and a high priest for us. That notice follows other reminders in Hebrews 2 and Hebrews 4 that the things we endure painfully, Jesus also experienced as having been laid upon him by God. This continuity between Jesus' afflictions and our afflictions as his people is a major warning of his teaching that people must count the cost of following him. His salvation of us involves a price that we also pay in the loss of our life, just as Jesus lost his. It's a gift, but we pay a price as the gift is worked out in us. In our case, losing our life is the loss of our malformed identity as shaped by alienation from God, the so-called flesh, which fuels our ambitions, our fears, our desires for control, our illusions of self-sufficiency, our greed, strife, and the rest. We must be made to lose this mess by our Heavenly Father's work to kill it within us. Too often, because we identify so closely with our ambitions and our rights, God's work appears to attack us directly. This is how it appears to us, but he is aiming at the apple that we have set atop our own heads. Since we have mistakenly made that apple our precious, and it dominates us, and it keeps, I am referring to Lord of the Rings, (laughs) and it keeps us from our Heavenly Father's abundant life. We will look at several ways the Bible soberly promises Jesus' life as the divine curriculum for our life. What happened to Jesus negatively is assured to happen to his disciples too. Following him means to go along the path that he walked. His path was strewn with troubles, and the troubles remain there for us as we walk in his steps. So we've seen before 1 Peter 2, uh, 21, you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. I think I made it through about five years of theological education without ever grappling with this verse. I don't know how I managed to do that. John 5, 18, uh, 15, 18 to 20. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Romans 8, 16 to 18, we are children of God, and if children, or since children, heirs also, heirs of God, fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we also may be glorified with, by him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that's to be revealed to us. The path of Jesus' life is laid for us to walk also. It is a difficult path but such is required to purge and attack the deformity and sludge that is our defilement from living from ourselves. Sin is a problem of trying to live without God, according to our own devices. We only let go of our long habits and deeply ingrained attachments to ambition, envy, greed, and the rest by suffering the pains that God designs upon us. Like a surgeon wielding her scalpel, 
or an oncologist measuring out toxic chemo and radiation to attack a cancer in the body, our loving Heavenly Father orders our afflictions to attack our attachments to our false identity formed from sin. So think of what God did with Joseph in Egypt. Over the process of 20 years, forming him from being a pretty snotty, stuck-up teenager, willing to boast about his visions and dreams that he's had, to somebody who's ready to forgive the people who, that sold him as a slave. Uh, when I had my eardrum burst and I could not work for two weeks, my students were happy to have canceled class, but <laughs> I was not. One thing that appeared to me sharply is how worthless I felt because I couldn't work. The temporary disability was an attack on my illusion that my worth is from my work. My Father in Heaven liberated me from this defilement of sin. He has a good purpose in our pain, just as Jesus suffered for good purposes as ordered by his Father in Heaven. So we, we don't have to see our pain this way, but if we do, it makes it much easier to bear. There's a huge difference between thinking somebody is trying to stab me, to cut, you know, to, to harm me, and thinking that, wait, I have a cancerous tumor, she's a surgeon, and she is going to give me another two decades of life. How we respond, how we interpret, makes all the difference, and Scripture gives us these keys. In addition to the alignment of the Christian experience with Jesus' experience of afflictions, the Bible reveals that all the everyday troubles we experience are purposeful devices of God in the attack on our real problems from the defilement of sin. So our suffering is not the problem. Our suffering is the solution. The problem is our attachment to sin, and God goes on the attack. Even the troubles that come from our own stupidity or pride are instructive about the damages of sin to warn us off of it. What is more, God offers to meet us and show us what he is doing in our trouble if we are ready to hear that what is happening to us is from his hand. If we know he is at work, then we can talk to him about that work, and we can embrace it like we would embrace chemo or surgery to accomplish the benefits he intends. Knowing God is at work on us paradoxically gives the assurance and joy at his attention in the context of our distresses that otherwise may be dismissed as merely troubles of this life in the world. Daily troubles are tests of faith, crises to provoke us to recourse to God and leave off our familiar patterns of living by our own wits and for our own ambitions or to stave off our fears instead of handing them over to God. James reminds us, James 1, 2 to 5, Consider it all joy, my brethren, sisterin, when you encounter various trials. Notice how it's ambiguous and inclusive. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing, sanctification. But if any of you lacks wisdom, particularly about what is happening that's distressing, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. The Bible promises, and the history of the church have shown, that Christians will be distressed and troubled by circumstances in daily life alongside everyone else. For the child of God, all these troubles are the Father's love for them, because he is doing good to them by answering their prayer to sanctify them. Jesus' suffering for us does not exempt us from suffering with him, in daily life as, dis as his disciples, brothers and sisters, and members of his virtual body on earth. We are also told that God is now forming Christ in us, and biblical statements about Christian maturity, Christian transformation, fulfillment, discipleship, and perfection all point to Jesus as the goal of our individual existence. Uh, we are conformed to the image of the Son. We are to be made personally exact copies of him. No one can do this to ourselves, but we are told our Heavenly Father has this agenda for each of us. Accordingly, with God as the agent of our sanctification, like the surgeon or the oncologist applying medicine to the patient, the primary metaphor of our sanctification to become like Jesus is crucifixion with Jesus. So we've seen Luke 9:23. Uh, to come after him, we must deny ourselves and take up the cross daily and follow him. And it's a cross that he lays on us. For the child of God, this cross-bearing is a lifelong embrace of Jesus, whether they have been aware of it or not. And so, for example, I see uh, having the flu as an aspect of God's cross for me and work that he's doing through it. The Apostle Paul declares to us 
that the attack on our life apart from God, trying to live apart from God, has already begun with our conversion. In Romans 6, uh, 3 and verse 5 and 6, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? For if we have become united with him in, in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves of sin. So we should not think of crucifixion as merely what Jesus suffered spectacularly for us 2,000 years ago so we could be free from sin. This is true. But the crucifixion must be done to us also throughout our life here. This form of execution is a long duration, not an instantaneous act. When the Bible speaks of us having been crucified, we connect this with take up his cross daily for the meaning that our crucifixion by our Father in heaven is occurring right now until we come to the end of our life here. Since the meaning of our ongoing crucifixion is, what God, is that God is sanctifying us, we may connect the terms to form a new word, crucifixion, which means sanctification by daily crucifixion. Crucifixion, crucifixion means that Jesus' life of meaningful and providentially ordered suffering is the life God has planned for the Christian's life as conformed to Jesus. Crucifixion cannot be done to oneself. I think this is also why baptism is supposed to be done to us by someone else. It must be applied by a person, by, by another person than me. Jesus' cross-bearing is extended to the disciples' share in their own cross. Jesus had to bear sins to death. Disciples also must bear the death of sins in the continuing tendencies to live from themselves instead of living dependent on God. For Jesus and the disciple, cross-bearing involves denying things that diverge from or obstruct the creature from responding to God. The Father always intends good results through the suffering ordered for his children. As with baptism, that is a picture and experience of drowning the old self that is alienated from God, crucifixion is an attack on the flesh, an execution to destroy all that obstructs God's life from coming through. And then, after death, resurrection can be provided out of the remainder when sin has been blasted, drowned, and crucified. So what is the effect of suffering for the Christian? Suffering drives us to engage with our Father in heaven. We can express our complaints, we can protest, we can ask him for help. Suffering is the sign of his nearness to us because in our suffering, in this affliction, we are assured that God is working to sanctify us and bring us to the experience of the abundant life that he has promised to us. Discover who you're called to be at Biola University, a leading Christ-centered university in Los Angeles, with programs on campus and online. Subscribe for more of our videos and learn more at biola.edu.